This morning, um, I'll tell you where the sermon came from. My mother-in-law, several years ago, she gave me a book, Christmas uh, gift, and she, she said, Matt, this book was powerful to me, and I want you to read it too. And so years later, I ended up reading the book, and it was powerful because it gave me a different picture of God than I had already known, um, not the typical one that I talk about all the time. And so as I read through that book, I thought, man, this is a sermon. I've got to preach that. And so that's where the sermon comes from today. So I invite you just to bow your heads and pray with me as we begin. Heavenly Father, today we're here in your presence to know you and understand you better, and I ask that you'll do just that, that you'll create an image in our minds that we can understand you, that we can see you, that we can know you in a different way than we already understand you. So guide us as we open your word and help us to see you clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. October 19, 2011, two worlds collided in Zanesville, Ohio. It was a normal day. Kids got up, they went to school. Parents got up, they went to work. Just a normal average day, kind of a cool day in in Ohio in October. And the 911 operators, the dispatchers, they began to get these very interesting phone calls. It was a phone call from somebody who says, there's a wolf near the high school. Another phone call came in, uh, there's a mountain lion roaming in my backyard. Somebody else called and said, there is a full-grown adult male lion that is walking down the streets of Zanesville, Ohio. There's a, there's a man, here, here's a picture of him, this is Terry Thompson. He was a private zoo owner, and he decided to release all 50-plus of his exotic animals out into the public before taking his own life. It was terrifying. Can you imagine this? I mean, we have Wakiva Springs black bears. No, 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 no. Th- think, think of this. Here's, here's the list. See if you recognize any of these, these animals. Um, so you have Bengal tigers roaming the streets, lions, black bears, grizzly bears, mountain lions, leopards, and wolves all released, roaming the streets. There was, a, there was different signs around town. Here's one of them. Here's a picture of it. Caution, exotic animals, stay in your car. Jack Hanna, maybe you know him, he's one of these uh, celebrity animal handlers. He wrote these words. He said, it's like Noah's Ark wrecking right here in Ohio. (laughs) I mean, can you imagine this? These animals just roaming down the streets? This is not normal. For one evening, tigers and lions, instead of being in African and Asian jungles and Sahara desert, whatever it is, they roamed the streets of suburban America. Two worlds collided. The wild invaded the civilized. The exotic clashed with the ordinary. The fierce clashed with the feeble. And when we think of God and what he looks like, so often we miss part of who he is. Because when we read the Bible, we read uh, words that are powerful about him, that, are, that describe him in a powerful, majestic way, uh, an extreme way, like he's the judge of the universe, or he is the all-consuming fire. You've read that in there. He's the Lord of hosts. In the Bible, he's described with majesty and with power, so much so that the angels, they whisper in his presence because he's so powerful. He's described in this omnipotent, all-powerful way. But if we really believe that God is this fiercely all-powerful and awesome being, wouldn't we respond like the people in Zanesville when we are in his presence? Hold up into our house, calling 911 because there's an emergency? Would we act differently if we were in God's presence? Like, would our church services be different? more trembling and awe-filled, like we're peeling back the curtain and looking in on the Most High God. I wonder, do you think, and I'll put it on the screen here, have we forgotten how big God really is? So often we focus on the wonderful, peaceful, manageable side of God. That's His mercy and grace side. And to be honest, I think that's what his heart really looks like, a God of just pure love that will do anything for anyone. That's who he is. But to be honest, there's another part of God, the other side, that we try to cage in our human perspective. See, all too oftenly, often, we choose to look at his grace and love and forgiveness, but we forget his justice too. 
God is a God of justice, of morality, good and evil, right and wrong, and he demands obedience. His mercy and grace is there too. It's like he's the greatest conundrum of all time. He reminds me of the ocean. Now, I've been to the ocean many times. You have too. You live in Florida. But I remember the very first time that my oldest son, Caffrey, experienced the ocean. Here's a picture of the first experience. We were just a family of three at the time. This is right up the road in Daytona Beach. We'd come down for some pastor's meetings. And, and one day, the first day we were there, Jen and I said, hey, let's, let's take Caffrey down to the beach. Now, we weren't planning on getting wet that day. He's just an infant. He still has that teething necklace around him. Uh, but little, little Caffrey, we were up high on the shore there, way away from the water, and he was double fisting sand into his mouth. Pretty soon, his little crawl took him down closer to those waves, and soon after he experienced, here's the video of it, his very first wave. There it is, cold water on that boy. He was surprised, trying to figure it out, what is this stuff? <laughs> to him, the waves of the ocean are just little splashes of spray. They're lovely. They're fun. They're cool and crisp. The ocean is a beautiful thing. But he didn't know what I knew, which was the ocean can get rough too. Its waves can get big. He doesn't know or didn't know what it was like to be underwater before. I've seen waves. I used to live up in Berrien Springs, Michigan while I was there at seminary. Glad those years are over, somebody. Now, some of you, of you are heading back to Michigan very soon, so good for you guys. I, I'll stay here in Florida. <laughs> in Michigan, the storms come ripping through off of Lake Michigan, and in the wintertime, it just dumps snow right there. That lake affects snow right there in Berrien Springs, and it's awful, unless you really love snow. But in the summertime, those storms come across and it's just, it whips up the water and the waves. And as one storm came through, a good friend of mine, Donnie Keel, who also shares a love for photography, we both said, hey, let's go check out the, the lake, which is almost like an ocean. So we went out there and we started taking pictures. Here's what we found. Look, look at there. You've been to this lighthouse before. Some of you. That's a pier that goes right out there in St. Joseph, Michigan, but it's covered. You can't walk on that thing. That far end lighthouse, uh, this is what it looked like. Here's the next picture of it. Just, just water, just completely covering it. I've seen waves. I've seen the power of the ocean. Yet it's a beautiful thing, but it can be rough too. And just like the ocean has calm, is calm and peaceful, it can also be terrifying and powerful and scary. And God has two sides too, justice and mercy. Now I realize that for some of you this morning, it's, it's hard for you to even think of that powerful justice side of God because we love to live and dwell in the grace and mercy part of who he is and that's a beautiful part but if you're bold enough and brave enough to look at how big God really is this morning then I invite you to journey with me in Exodus chapter 19. If you have your Bible with you you can turn to Exodus 19. If you didn't bring a Bible there's a blue one in front of you and you can follow along on page 54. Same words that I'll have in my Bible and we'll, we can journey through this story together. Now, as you're turning to Exodus 19, I'll give you a little bit of context. The children of Israel have left Egypt. They have just watched God perform 10 miracles as he's opened the door for them to exit and exodus from Egypt. Now they're wandering in the wilderness. The story happens when they're 90 days into their journey, three months. This is the very beginning of a 40 year journey. They're just starting this journey. They have watched God split the ocean, the Dead Sea, as they can walk right through on dry land. They've watched him give them food, manna, quail, whatever it is he's provided for them. Most recently, they just saw him bring water out of a rock so that 2.5 million people can drink from it. I mean, it's amazing. He's, he's been the pillar of cloud during the day, the pillar of fire at night. They've been, he's been leading them along. When they get to Sinai, Mount Sinai, and Moses, in this interesting uh, relationship that we don't have now, where God would speak to a human and a human would speak to the other humans, God speaks to Moses and he says, these Israelites, they're my people. I want them to be my people. So Moses relays the message to the people and he says, God wants you to be his people. And the people say, we'll do everything he wants us to do. So Moses relays this back to God and God says, okay, Moses, I want to speak audibly to you in the presence of all the Israelites so they will know that you are my messenger. 
And so Moses comes back down and he gives these instructions. He says, I want you to wash yourselves, clean clothes, consecrate yourselves because you're about to hear the voice of Almighty God. He even says, we're going to put a rope up around the base of Mount Sinai, and anyone that crosses that rope is too close to the presence of God, you will either be stoned or shot with arrows. This is an intense event. He even goes so far as to say, refrain from sexual relations, because we want your focus on God as He speaks to you. And we pick up the story in Exodus 19, verse 16, here's what my Bible says. It says this, verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. I mean, just imagine that you're there with the Israelites. You've already washed yourself, you have clean clothes on, you've consecrated yourself, you've brought your whole family, you've come close to the mountain, you're in the foothills of Mount Sinai, you're right there and you're waiting for things to happen, and it all begins to break loose. You see this cloud starting to form on top of the mountain, just like the spindrift on the top of Mount Everest. You begin to hear things happening, you see lightning bolts zigzag across the sky and thunder claps across the area. It's terrifying, you're wondering what is happening? Smoke begins to form like there's a volcanic eruption beginning to happen at Mount Sinai. Smoke begins to pour down the side of the mountain, almost like an eerie horror movie. This darkness comes, this this smoke comes billowing down. You hear trumpet blasts like a tornado siren warning of something that's going to happen. You hear this company, the ground begins to tremble and shake. Your ears are about to split, so you cover your ears and you fall on your knees because you know that the presence of God is near. It sounds dangerous, doesn't it? Are you catching the picture of a mighty God? The power and the majesty that He has. Does it make you feel small in comparison to Him? And God calls Moses to the top of the mountain and he, He walks up through the clouds. And the Israelites wonder, will we ever see this man again? And I wonder, could he see where he's even walking? Did the glory of God shine a path for him as he clambered up the mountain as quickly as he could in excitement and fear at the same time? And he gets to the top and God hands him the Ten Commandments that he's written with his own finger. And he begins to tell uh, Moses about the Sabbath and he says, this Sabbath that I've given you is the most important thing ever. It's the sign between you and me. It's the time where we're together, just the two of us, just, just humans and God together. It's like putting a ring on that says, I am yours and you are mine. And as Moses is there, the Israelites are down below, waiting, watching, listening. Forty days pass. Forty days. That's not much time, is it? That's just a month, a little over a month, forty days. Here's how the story continues in chapter 32. Just flip over a couple of passages or pages to get to chapter 32. Exodus 32, we get the story. It's, in, uh, it's on page uh, 63, I believe. Here's what it says. Exodus 32, verse 1. Forty days have passed. Moses is on the mountain. Here's what it says. When the people saw that Moses was so long, 40 days, so long, in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and they said, Come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they, then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. 
When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. This happened 40 days after they've just experienced the God of the universe's voice speaking to them. 40 days later, and either they have an incredibly short memory and they can't remember what he sounded like, or they're like you and I, that when we experience God's majesty and the glory of God, we don't know how to handle it. It's almost like we can't wrap our minds around how big God is, and it makes me wonder, it makes me wonder this, let's put it up on the screen, do we minimize God's majesty so that we can have a more manageable deity? Do we put him in our pocket as Steve shared this morning? Do we dumb God down so that we can wrap our minds around him? Do we try to tame God? I mean, these Israelites, they said, let's make a God that we can manage, and they picked a cow. Is there any more docile animal? He munches grass and moves. We make hamburgers out of him. I mean, this cow gives us milk for our Cheerios. And they picked a cow to be their God, something they can control, something they can own. Do we try to do the same thing with Almighty God? I mean, we may not make a golden cow and set it up and worship it, but do we try to tame God? The reality is, is that God is so much bigger than we can ever understand that we can't tame Him. Paul describes God like this in Romans. He says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who's ever given to God that God should repay them? He's so much bigger than that. The Bible says that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. You can't understand him in his completeness. See, I believe, and as a kid, I always thought, when I get to heaven, I'm going to slide down the neck of a giraffe. I'm going to go swimming with dolphins. I'm going to fly from this planet to that planet. It's going to be awesome. But what I really think will happen in heaven is that when we get there, we sit down and we are in awe of who God is for all of eternity as he begins to unpack who he really is. And we sit there forever and ever saying, wow, this is who God really is. He's so big. He's unfathomable. He's uh, impossible to comprehend. He's just so big. Ultimately, we are like ants crawling across an iPad screen in touch with something that we really don't understand. He's such a big God, untamable, dangerous. The Bible talks about when God descended on Mount Sinai that the people trembled. But when they were around the golden calf, they ate food and danced. You don't tremble when you have an idol in front of you. You can see it, you can, it's tangible, it's visible. But God, on the other hand, he's dangerous because he's so powerful. Margaret Feenberg, she writes in her book, Wonderstruck, Awaken to the Nearness of God, she says this. She says, many of us say we want to experience God, but we don't look for his majesty. We travel life's paths with our heads down, focused on the next step with our careers or families or retirement plans, but we don't really expect God to show up with divine wonder. In, in our efforts to, to understand God, we've normalized him and brought him down to our level. We don't look for his majesty. I mean, even in our prayers when we pray, we, we pray for miracles, but in the back of our heads, it's always doubt. Can he really do what he says he can do? Will he do what he says he can do? Does he have the power for this? I mean, here's the reality. Making God strange, something we don't understand, actually helps us know him more. It doesn't make sense completely, but once we marvel at his mysteriousness, what we can't understand, we're able to become closer to him by appreciating who he really is, someone that we can't understand. 
Instead of treating him as an equal, we can approach him with reverent awe. And only when we've been awestruck by his majesty, it's then that we can be overcome by his love. The all-powerful being of the universe, the one that could say the words and you'd be obliterated, he's also the one that loves you so much that he died for you. See, here's the reality is I want my God to be dangerous. I want him to be incomprehensible and all-powerful and all-knowing and always present. I want my God to make everyone and everyone else tremble at his presence. I want him to be dangerous because when I see him as a powerful, dangerous God, his love and care and kindness and grace and his mercy for me means so much more. You know, as disciples of Jesus, as disciples of a dangerous God, I believe that we're called to be dangerous too. I really do. And at one point, Jesus in the New Testament, he's talking about all disciples ever, forever on, and he says, I'm going to build my church and not even the gates of hell will be able to stand against it. That is a group of dangerous people that serve a dangerous God. That's a people on a mission to spread a message about an all-powerful God that can take sinners and save them for all eternity. That's the power he has. That's a dangerous God that can take hurting hearts and make them whole again. That's a dangerous God that can transform lives from brokenness and bitterness into lives that flourish. That's a dangerous God that empowers humans on his mission. And when we speak his name, Satan trembles in his boots because he knows in the end, Jesus wins. That's a dangerous, dangerous God. One of my heroes is a man named Daniel Walker. Never met him, but I know his story. He served as a detective in New Zealand for over 20 years, but now he no longer is a detective. He, he serves in a different capacity where he goes to the most dangerous, um, filthy places on the planet to help sex trafficked victims. He'll go to all sorts of countries and go into the brothels, and he has a hidden camera where he uh, can capture footage of what he needs, the transactions that take place, so that he can turn it into the authorities, so that the bad guys go to jail. He's been all over the planet. At one time, he was in Colombia, and he goes into this, this brothel. It's filthy. All the guys there are walking around with machine guns, and he wonders, is today the day that I die? It's today the day that somebody figures out that I'm not here for pleasure. I'm here to bust people. He's wondering, is he going to die that day? And as he's there, he senses demonic uh, uh, presence. He knows that Satan is there. This is not a place where God's power is. It's just sin in there. In order to uh, show the transactions that are being taken place, he has to pay for someone. She's under 16 years old. And she's there with him, and his heart is breaking, and he's filled with fear. He's afraid that today's his last day on earth. He says in his article that he writes, The tables turned when I saw this prostitute, not as a threat to my purity, he's a Christian, not as a threat to my professionalism, but I saw her as a child of God whom he greatly loved. He said, I was filled with this all-consuming holy hatred for the way evil had ensnared her small life, a holy anger in a world that allows children to be sold as playthings for the lusts of men. I captured on my covert camera enough evidence to put the bad guys in jail. If anyone was dangerous in that place, he said, it was me. This gets me fired up. I mean, I think of Peter and Paul, and they're, they're preaching, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they say, we don't want you talking about this guy named Jesus, and so they throw him in jail, and when they get out of jail, they go back to the disciples, and they pray with them, but they don't pray for safety. They don't pray for, for protection. They pray for holy boldness because they have a message that can't be stopped, that has to be shared, that is a dangerous message because it changes people's lives. That's what I want in my life, too. I want to be bold. I don't want to have protection. I don't want to pray for a hedge of protection around me. I want to have holy boldness that is, shares a message about a dangerous God that can't be stopped, that can't be bitten, beaten, that won't be tamed, and that's in love with sinners. 
like you and me, and he won't stop until you and I are with him in heaven forever. That's what I want. Holy boldness. I'm going to pray for you this morning, and in this prayer, I'm going to leave it open. And I'm not sure what your prayer will look like. Your prayer might say something like, God, I don't really know who you are, but I want you to make me bold. Your prayer might sound like, God, make me fearless. God, make me dangerous. But I invite you to pray with him as I pray for you. Heavenly Father, today, we've looked at a different side of you than we normally look at, a powerful, dangerous side. And God, my prayer is that you will give each and every one of us this this yearning, this burning to be dangerous on your mission too, God. So in the middle of this prayer, I'm going to leave it open. You're all powerful. You can hear every one of us, God, as we pray to you now. God, it's only by your power that we can make an impact. So I ask that you'll do that through our church, through these lives, through these families. Make us dangerous, God. We love you so much and we can't wait to see you. In Jesus' name, amen.